Hello and welcome to the panel, How to Make a Great First Impression in Interviews here at GraduCon. Uh, I'm Patrick Houlihan, Patrick Houlihan, the uh, Assistant Director of Graduate Services in the Social Sciences here at CAPT. And how it's going to work today, uh, we have a slate of panelists who are going to respond, uh, give their own, each of them, about five minutes each. Uh, we'll talk about some um, issues related to making first impressions. And then the last 15 to 20 minutes will be opened up to the floor for uh, questions and answers. So uh, I'll briefly introduce our, our panelists and uh, we'll leave, if they want to tell more about themselves in the course of their uh, personal presentations, we'll leave that to them. So uh, in alphabetical order, we are pleased to welcome Leora Auslander, who is a professor of history here at the University of Chicago, and Haley Hill, who is uh, at the Boston Consulting Group and holds a PhD from Northwestern University. Jonah Kushner from the Heartland Alliance, who has a master's in public policy from the University of Chicago. And David Schuster, who's at the University of Chicago in the physics department with a PhD from Yale. So uh, without further ado, I'll leave it to the uh, panelists in alphabetical order, starting with Leora. Thanks, Patrick, and um, welcome to every to everyone. Uh, I am, as Patrick said, a historian, and I'll t uh, be talking from um, from that perspective, and particularly about the question of um, handling the con uh, convention interview, which is, uh, which is, and I think what I have to say about that is probably common for other um, most other disciplines besides history that have large scale convention interviews. I've been on both the being interviewed side, obviously, or I wouldn't have a job at this point. Um, and I've also done quite a lot of interviewing um, as for both junior and senior colleagues. And the first thing that I'd like to say about um, doing convention interviews is that it's, uh, it's been much easier than I ever would have hoped when I've been interviewing people to uh, eliminate people from the application process. Now, this is a dismal way to start, but it's an important way to start. Because a crucial piece of advice I have about making a good impression at a convention interview is to, is to prepare, which again, seems like an obvious comment, but there are a series of things that one must walk into that interview room able to do that uh, people finishing their PhDs often are unable to do. Uh, and the first one is simply to be able to talk clearly and coherently and succinctly about your dissertation. Uh, that that's the way most interviews start, I think, in most disciplines. And people think that they know their dissertation so well that there is no need to practice, rehearse, and work out a short interview scheme, a uh, paragraph about the dissertation that really needs to be rehear written, rehearsed, memorized, performed. Uh, and because if you lose it at that point, it's gone. So um, I would just like to, to reinforce that fundamental point. A second, uh, equally perhaps, I, and I hope I'm not telling you things that you know already, but uh, is to have done research about the institution that, at which you are interviewing uh, and have some idea about uh, who is in the department, but above all about what they teach there and how they teach it, who their students are, to be very certain that you present yourself uh, as interested in teaching their student body in the format of courses that they teach. Uh, I'm, one of the things that's hard about, one of the things that's great about looking for a job from the University of Chicago is that we do have a very good reputation uh, uh, for uh, that, you, that you all are, are, walk into a room with the presumption that you are very, very good at what you do. The institution, unfortunately, also has a reputation for arrogance. And so one of your tasks is often to persuade people that you are actually interested in teaching at their institution. Uh, and again, research is a crucial way of doing that. So that if, they have, if it's an institution that has only large courses, it obviously you don't want to walk in and talk about uh, you know, how good you are at teaching 12-person intense seminars. If the course is a sign uh, at the place you're going, that you're interviewing a sign, uh, 20 pages of reading a week, orient yourself that, towards that. Uh, the, the bottom line in both my advice about um, the presenting your research as well as presenting your teaching is that what places are looking for are colleagues, not, uh, not students. And so what they are interested in is what you can do for them as opposed to how interesting or appealing you find the institution for yourself. Many, many job letters I've read from uh, finishing PhD students 
uh, are oriented around how interesting they would find it to be at that institution, how much they would learn, how much they would benefit. Frankly, hiring, uh, hiring committees don't care. Uh, what they care about is um, how useful and helpful you are going to be for the institution. Uh, and another way besides the two strategies I just outlined to do that is also to have thought, try to think institutionally about where you're going. That is, most interviews will end with a question, uh, what questions do you have for us? And that seems like a throwaway question and it is anything but a throwaway question. Uh, what they want to know at that point, above all, is are you thinking about how that institution functions and how you can take part in it? So, for example, you could ask questions about, you could say something about how you'd be really interested in organizing conferences on a set of topics that would bring in people, that would both involve people in, on the campus and bring in people from elsewhere. Is there funding for such a thing? Or you've been involved in collaborative issues of collaborative research or collaborative teaching, and might there be possibilities of doing that? Or uh, that you found it very interesting and productive to be involved as a resident head in, or, uh, in, uh, in, in, in student life, and that was something that you would be interested in continuing as a faculty member. That register of question, again, you can do that best if you have done some research about the institution and know whether they have study abroad programs, whether they have language houses, all of the kinds of things that colleges and universities do to make undergraduate life better. So again, if you can project yourself into the, into the mindset of, uh, of, of collegiality rather than studentship, that is the fundamental uh, thing to do. So um, I, my five minutes are up, so I will stop uh, and be happy to answer questions. Um, so, as Patrick said, my name is Haley Hill. I am a project leader, so I manage um, consultants, and I work for a company um, called the Boston Consulting Group. Um, prior to joining consulting, I was actually getting my PhD in chemistry at Northwestern University, and so I've taken a slightly different approach to, um, rather than continuing in academics and going to do a postdoc, I found myself being really interested in business and thinking about well, should I perhaps go back to business school? What else is there out there besides science? I had been in chemistry sort of my entire academic life. Um, and I first became interested in consulting, attending a panel actually just like this. Um, and so the panel question that we're supposed to be talking about is how to make a good first impression in your interview. And I'm here to tell you if you're doing consulting interviews, actually what needs to happen is something that you need to personally sort out for yourself before you even get to the interview. Um, the number one thing that we're really looking for um, when we're looking at PhDs or JDs or MDs that are looking to make the switch into business is actually that people have spent enough time thinking about the decision and are really passionate about making a change and aren't sort of on the fence going, well, I don't really know. My advisor might be worried. I haven't told them. Um, and so. Before you start interviewing or thinking about consulting, you need to do a little bit of soul searching about what you want in your career. And uh, we only have five minutes per person, so I'm happy to talk and answer questions about why I made the switch to consulting and what I like about it. Um, but by the time you get to the interview, you should be able to really have a clear explanation of why it is that you liked academics, and but why you want to make a change, and what interests you in consulting and why you um, might want to work on a team or might want to tackle business problems instead of physics or chemistry problems or medical questions. Um, when you're actually physically then in the interview, a couple of other things that people are looking for, I think perhaps more um, if you're doing any sort of business interview is um, really looking for polish and practice. So it seems it seems funny to sort of practice saying your, your thesis, a summary of it, but if you can't give a compelling 30-second explanation of the work that you did in graduate school that your mom or your grandmother could understand, people will wonder if you can communicate other hard topics um, to clients that you may be working with. And so I would echo what was said earlier, that really spending that time, no matter what type of job you're looking for, to be able to explain your work to someone from outside the field will be critical. Um, I think with that, I'll stop. I, actually, I'm going to respond to one of the other questions that was put forward. Um, they sent us some prompt questions 
um, that we could think about answering. And I think one of them was, how does one talk about their academic training when you're perhaps applying for a job outside of academia where it's harder perhaps to frame teaching apprenticeships or research associates positions. And I think what I would say is think of it as you were working for a small um, startup company or a pharmaceutical company and frame it as, you know, I was leading a research project. If you were leading a team, talk about leading a team and don't underplay the value um, of teaching courses or you know mentoring other students in the lab. Um, a lot of times graduate students tend to think of that not as work experience and I think you do yourself a disservice as not framing it as such. So that is one piece of advice no matter for where you're going whether consulting or not is think about that, those work projects that you've done as work and not as school. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is David Schuster. Um, I just started about a year ago in the uh, physics department here. And so the interview experience uh, is still uh, very fresh in my mind. And uh, we've also uh, started hiring. So I'm, I'm also now seeing it from, from the other side. Uh, and, uh, and so, um, yeah, so I'd just like to tell you a little bit about uh, sort of uh, my process and, and, and what I've seen on both sides. So, I mean, uh, maybe the first thing, uh, at least with, and, and maybe particularly from the perspective of a sort of a, a science and, and academics. Um, so there's actually, I mean, with academics, there's a pretty kind of set process, unlike, you know, a company where each company sort of has their own way of doing things. There, there's kind of a, a rough process which everyone will go through, which is that, of course, the most important thing you do is your research and getting publications and things like that. And by the time the interview is coming around, there's usually not too much you can do about that. Um, uh, but what you can do uh, when you're trying to get the interview, of course, is, is, uh, is you write typically a research plan and, uh, and, uh, and a teaching statement. And I think a very key point uh, to emphasize with when you're doing that is that um, the people on the other side of the table actually, you spend you know, days or weeks uh, trying to make every word perfect, and they spend about five minutes reading it. Um, and uh, if you're lucky, actually, when I went around to the interview process, uh, I found that actually people who had read the statement were actually the, very much the exception. Um, and those are people are definitely people you want to pay extra special attention to because they're, they're the ones who are most interested. But, uh, but, uh, but, and so what you have to do is make sure that whatever point you're trying to get across, that you can get across in five minutes. And so, you know, for example, just specifically with that, um, you know, if I could say one thing is basically make the first paragraph of whatever you say, if, if, they, if they stop there, they should still have a pretty good idea of what you want to do and why it's interesting. Um, and this is sort of a, a generic thing. I mean, you're, you'll, you're going to meet, when you actually get to the interview, whether, and this is probably true also on the business side, yeah, you know, you might talk with them for a half an hour and they'll meet with 10 other people and ever. And so, you know, your interview might be one of five interviews and they're extremely important to you, but it's, you know, mixed in with a bunch of other things that the other people are doing. So, um, so and, and that, I mean, I think the, the previous points, uh, I mean, you can see that this is a recurring theme of, of sort of preparation and being able to really express why what you've done is relevant and important in a, in, in a concise thing. And that's why it's so important. It's just because there's, there's not a lot of time. Um, uh, just a, another tip is if when you come, anything that shows preparation is, is a real good sign. So, you know, if you're in science, you may need resources, you know, equipment, things like that when you get there. And it's not that anyone really wants to hear the numbers of how much everything will cost or anything. But if you've shown that you've thought about it a lot and that you really know what you need to do in order to make whatever vision you've now convinced them that is, is worth pursuing, if you can convince them that you also know what's necessary to do that, uh, that's really important. Um, another big question um, that comes up in academics is, uh, um, so you've, if you get an interview, um, it means that you did some really fantastic work and you're probably in a, in a hot field with a really famous uh, um, uh, person that you're working for. And that's really great and that's one of the reasons they want to hire you. But that means you now have to compete with these really, all these famous professors in this really hot field that everybody's trying to do. And so you have to somehow differentiate yourself. Um, not by saying, you know, actually, you know, I worked for him, but it was all my idea. That, that doesn't work. Um, but you have to sort of, you know, kind of 
delineate, you have to sort of draw a line between what you've done and what you're going to do. And it's not, and of course you want to build, you don't want to make a right turn, a right angle turn or, or 180 degree turn, but you want to, uh, uh, you want to show how your experience will be relevant, but how you're going to do something that's going to lead the field in five years, because it's going to take you a couple of years to get going. And so it's, it's actually a sort of a higher bar than not what am I going to do next, but sort of what am I going to do that's going to set a new direction. Um, and, and, uh, and that's a hard question and you will inevitably get asked, but even if they don't ask, you know, in your research statement or, you know, even unprompted, you should be able to answer that question. Um, in terms of the other part of an academic interview that's important, of course, is the talk. You know, usually you give some kind of a, whether it's an informal discussion to colleagues, of course it's still formal, uh, or, 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 you know, a big talk in front of the whole department. Um, so again, I think, you know, the points that were emphasized, the, uh, you know, basically being able to uh, convey the, the, you know, the impact of what you've done. But, but uh, and it should really be accessible to everyone. So you might think, oh, well, I'm going to an academic job interview and they're interested in my really specific technical work that, that's going to be groundbreaking. Um, but actually, there's probably two or three people in the department um, that, that really know your work and have been pushing to get you there. But the rest of them know nothing, probably. Um, probably about as much as your mother. Um, and so, and, and, uh, so you have to... Uh, um, so you have to convey something, and so I mean, you want to. I think the trick with that is that you have your talk should be. Uh, everybody should get something out of it. Uh, that's really important. They should. Everybody should walk away and say, "I learned at least one thing," and then. Uh, but you have to show some depth, and I mean, there's different ways of doing this, but uh, but but that's the sort of the the the, the trick. Um, and uh, and that and that maybe brings one one last point uh, with the academic interview, which is that. Uh, um, basically, for a, uh, um, you, I said there, there'll be a couple people who really are familiar with the work, and you kind of, I think it's it's very important in some sense to to have a champion um, for for your hire. You know, if, if not, you have to have you have to convince everybody that you know you're good to have. Um, if anybody thinks that you're bad, you probably won't get the job. But uh, if uh, but you have to convince at least one person that they really have to have you and that you're the best thing and that they will, because you're not in the room when they make the decision. And so you need someone to, and so, I mean, sometimes it's obvious who that is, that's a person who invited you or not. But you want to make sure that, um, you know, that you give them the ammunition that they need to sell you to the rest of their colleagues. Um, uh, yeah, so maybe that's a good place to, to, to turn it over. Hi, I'm Jonah Kushner. I work for something that's called the Social Impact Research Center. And um, the Social Impact Research Center is a nonprofit research organization. And what we do is we answer research questions for other organizations that have research needs but don't have the capacity to answer them. So other nonprofit organizations or foundations or sometimes governments will come to us with their research questions. Um, questions like how best do we serve our clientele, where should we expand our services, where should we open up a new meal program, um, how is our job training program for low-income people working and how can we improve it, and we do that research on contract for them. It's, I think, maybe a little bit like consulting, although we're not paid nearly as much to do it. Um, so I graduated from the Harris School of Public Policy in 2010, and I've been working for Impact um, pretty much since then. And I've been on both sides of the interview process. The trauma of interviewing is still relatively fresh in my mind. And I've also um, had the opportunity to interview graduate students um, who are applying for internships with us, many of whom are from the University of Chicago. So I've been, I've been on both sides of it. Um, I can't tell you anything about the academic job market, but I can tell you an embarrassing interview story that I have, and I think it will be um, hopefully entertaining and germane um, and echo what the other three panelists have said um, so far. So in my second year in graduate school, I was going to an interview with a big evaluation company in New York, and I was interviewing for um, a technical research analyst position, which is a position um, that cleans and validates data and prepares it for analysis to see um, how a big program to help low-income people succeed um, is, is working. So this position would be on the data end. And I flew to New York, and um, the company had asked me to submit a programming sample in a statistical package, and I'd done, having gone to the University of Chicago and done some research internships, I had done some work in Stata. Um, who knows Stata? Who likes Stata? Anybody? 
Any, is anybody a state a person? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, and I figured, well, they just, they want this sample just so they can, you know, they, they know you've worked in a statistical package. It's not, it's not going to be a big deal. I'll just, you know, I'll submit this thing I did in a research assistantship. So this was a multiple person interview. Um, so I interviewed with the first person, then I went to another room with the second person, and she pulled out my programming sample on a printout. And this is something that I had not worked on for months and months. I'd largely forgotten. Um, and she started asking me questions about it. Um, what's this variable? Why are you using it? What's this interaction term? Why did you decide on including this interaction term in this model? Why did you specify this this way? And I really struggled to answer her questions all, all the way through. Um, and it was horrible. And at, so toward the end, she asked me, well, what, what, have, you, what have you learned? Uh, do you have any results from, from these models yet? Can you talk about that? And I said, you know, I haven't worked on this in a long time. And it's, um, it's really, it's not, I'm not finished doing the work. And it was just, it was abysmal. So um, and again, it seems like, you know, a, a, a hint like practice your dissertation or know what your dissertation is about and be able to talk about it in 30 seconds seems obvious. And, you know, be prepared seems obvious, too. But going into an interview, you are responsible for everything, everything that you submit to a prospective employer, every work sample, every writing sample, every job on your resume. You need to be able to, I mean, whatever comes across their desk from you, you should be able to talk about it, and you should be able to relate it to um, why you're applying there and what your goal is. Um, and in fact, uh, interviewing people who are applying for internships with us, um, I have picked up and been somewhat annoyed by people who have put something on their resume but can't explain its germaneness or why it's important. So I've, I've seen both sides of um, not being prepared. Okay, you're all wondering who is the strange person who came in late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your late moderator, Chipo Nyambuya. I'm working with the uh, British Consulate here in Chicago. Uh, I have been obviously on both sides of the of the interview and professional pre preparation process, so I am not going to belabor you know my experience. I'm going to turn it over to the to the panelists, and um, kind of uh, ask a few. Actually, turn it to the panelists, but turn it over to you so that you can engage with the panelists, um, so you guys can kind of figure out you know pick through pick through the questions that you need to from them. So I'm going to open up the floor for questions. I'm going to walk over, get the mic, and so you guys can, everyone can hear the questions. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over. First question. Um, I guess I have a two-part question. The first is, what are your suggestions if you have a phone interview? And not just a phone interview, but if it's a FaceTime or Skype interview. And if you have suggestions on how to present yourself when the person can and when they cannot see you. The first one is to make sure your Skype setup works um, and that there is no noise. I mean, the, the, the technical is tested um, because, again, a lot of those interviews dissolve simply because of the technical problems. The other is to test it in terms of what you're wearing. And this is something that I wanted to say otherwise, is that, is that um, even though academia tends to be informal, in many contexts, interviews are not a place where it is. And so that, that to, make, and to make sure that what you're doing works over, over video, which it, which it might not. And uh, and the and oh and in um, non Skype interviews, a crucial thing is to a is to ask at the beginning for everybody to to identify themselves each time they speak, because there are probably four or five people on that end and one at your end, and it's very disorienting if you have no idea who's talking, and people won't think of doing that. Uh, succinctness and coherence are even more important over the phone than they are in person because you don't have the body language to, and even Skype, it's 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 awkward. So, uh, so the issues of preparation are even more important. And asking people to send you uh, some information ahead of time is perfectly legitimate and important. The kind of questions that they that they would like you to think about ahead of time, so that you because all of the kind of hesitations, ums, ers, and 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 uh, things one does does to gain time face to face don't work in that context. I, I would I would say, um, and maybe it's on the obvious, but find a quiet, secure space where you can be with if it's a phone interview, a good connection for however long you have to be there, or perhaps even uh, add half an hour to that or something. Um, I think that. Uh, caps here when I had done phone interviews helped me set up a room. So that's that's always an option. That's good. I think 
one thing, so we don't, we don't personally do phone interviews, but having done a lot of interviews with clients over the course of the years that I've been in consulting, I think one thing you can do for yourself is if you dial into the conversation early, actually, you can be that sort of cheerful voice on the phone that's greeting people as others are mm -hmm. dialing in. If you're sitting there quietly and the whole group dials in and they don't know if you're there, it does not s serve you very well. So try and be bolder than you might naturally want to be on the phone. I have a question about um, submitting um, sample code for um, job applications. Um, what sort of things would um, would an employer be looking for when evaluating um, such a code sample? That's a good question. I don't know that I got I got that far. Um, I could have asked if I got hired. I could have said, "What are, what are you looking for?" Um, I don't think that the program matters as much. That's one thing maybe not to be concerned about. The place that I was looking at, uh, they work exclusively in SAS. That's their program and I was submitting it in, in Stata and I think that, that was fine. Um, I think just um, you know, a familiarity with basics of coding and facility doing some operations. Um, one, one thing I think, well I mean maybe I, I would be looking for um, would be um, notation and maybe some careful reflection on your part. If you're doing a you know a log file in Stata, say you can annotate it, um, so that helps you. That helps the person who's looking for it. Um, yeah, maybe making making some notes. Um, I will probably add to that as well. Is that even if you submit sample code, also be prepared to write code on the spot because that happens often in interviews, particularly when you start talking about the. Um, uh, the companies who are competitive, competitive hires, competitive employers. So more than speaking to your code, because there's all of the whole thing on preparation, but more to speaking to your code, be able to then apply it in any context on the spot. Hi, um, Dr. Auslander, you mentioned something about University of Chicago applicants in particular being pigeonholed as being potentially arrogant. And Dr. Schuster, you mentioned that it's important to sort of um, set yourself apart from all the other hot shots that are applying without making it look like, oh, I, I did everything, my advisor, you know. And I've heard that this is in fact kind of especially a problem for female applicants in both having enough confidence and not appearing to be, you know, unapproachable because they are confident. So I'm wondering if you have any advice for how to strike a balance between, you know, to be confident but not appear to be arrogant. Yeah, so I mean, I think one, one, one thing you can do to help with this is you can use this also as an opportunity to, to show how you're collaborative. So I mean, if you can, if you can show how you worked with a bunch of other, um, uh, you know, capable people and, and, and then you can give, you know, for example, a specific example of something you contributed um, or, or how, you know, how you worked with people to, to make it better. So it's kind of highlighting your own contributions but, but in, in the context of a, of a group work, is, is, it's at least one tactic. And it, I mean, you can, always, uh, you can always tend one too far in either direction. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think that's, that's a good way, especially, I think probably even for a non-academic interview, um, because a lot of what they look for is, is, is actually, the collaboration may actually be more important than the specific achievement. And so what they want to know is that you worked in a group and, uh, and that you had a good idea but not only that you had a good idea, but that people listened to it. I mean, that's actually also quite important. Now, it's, inter it's interesting. The disciplinary differences are interesting because uh, I think historians, anthropologists, the human and the, the humanities tend to be much more individualist in their orientation. So we don't work as much with a faculty member in that intense way as a student. So there's less. In there's less issue of differentiating yourself from your mentor. But um, uh, I think that the issue of seeming self-confident and without being arrogant is. Um, is a trick and, and is, I think, often a trick, particularly for women. Uh, and I think women, more often than men, try to disarm a situation by smiling way too much and laughing way too much and being much too dynamic. So that is kind of hyper. Uh, and so there, that women tend to be afraid of seeming serious and afraid and, uh, and uh, so to try, I think, I think one of the best strategies for all of these things is to do lots and lots of practice interviews with people who will be brutally honest with you and hopefully also who don't know you beforehand. So take, seize every possible opportunity to do practice interviews, including 
you know, rope in your friends and your aunts and your cousins um, and get them to both the question of comprehensibility and also how, how you come off. Are you smiling continuously? Uh, and are you letting the person you're talking to get a, get a word in edgewise? So I think being, being serious and, and, and intense, but without, <coughs> as, but without, um, without hostility, without talking over people is, uh, is generally uh, a good thing. The preparedness goes a long ways towards com combating the arrogance also. That is, if you seem to have paid attention to the people who you're going to be talking to, that, that really matters. I'm going to steal a second to just also say something in, re in response to, your, to what you were saying before, which is that I agree with the champion question, but the, but the one caution I would have with, the ch with, with going after the champion, so to speak, is that I have been in interviews where somebody has decided who is their champion, and they speak only to that person. Uh, that they focus on one person, and that's the only person they speak to. That is fatal and catastrophic, uh, because everybody else will be really insulted. You do not know who in the room has power and you don't know who might be turned to become your champion. So just be very careful that you don't decide beforehand who, who has power and who doesn't and who matters to you and who doesn't. I wanted to extend on her question um, for the panelists. Preparedness, you, you know, as you indicated, and I, I would agree with that. Um, but are there any specific, and, I, and I'd like, to, sp I'd like to, to, to ask the two female panels, panelists specifically as female, and I want to ask the two male panelists specifically as males who are perceiving females what, what tips that they can give and what patterns that they've seen in interviews to kind of address that question, because it is something that um, particularly the female candidates will come across throughout their career, so kind of, you know, trying to overcome this early on I think would be helpful. So I'm happy to speak first on this. Um, I do, I sit on the interviewing side now for BCG and I think the number one thing that I see women do that I wish I could like reach over the table and shake them is they underplay their own accomplishments. Um, every, every woman that I see does this. There may have been a team, she might have led it, but she will say we, she won't distinguish herself as the leader or say sort of here is how I brought this group together. It's very much a we all did this. Um, and you undersell yourselves. And so I would say to the women in the audience, do not undersell yourself, um, especially if you're interviewing for a business position. University of Chicago graduates, arrogance is not something that comes to my mind when I think about interviewing um, UFC grads for positions at BCG. We usually think of, you know, really, really smart people, fantastic intellectually, and we're looking for people who click with our culture. And so don't undersell yourself, ladies. Um, you know, if you've done something fantastic and you were the catalyst that got it going, stand up and say, I made this happen. We worked as a team, but this was my idea. Um, or two men. Sure, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I, I actually, um, being a uh, male in my workplace, I'm in the extreme minority. I think that there's another guy on staff with us, and I think I think that's it. So um, I, I've I've not seen or had any any issue in um, uh, say interviewing candidates for internships with um, I mean women coming off as as too arrogant or um, not. Um, selling their accomplishments enough, and I think that's I think that's that's great. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, if I were a female applying for a job with us, um, yeah, I would echo: don't undersell, don't understate your your accomplishments, um, own things, and it is not going to come off as um, threatening or negative in any way. Hi, I have a question for Mr. Kushner. Yeah. So um, it's about uh, the internships that, that you were mentioning before. So I, I have a PhD from the English department, mm -hmm. and I'm changing careers now. I'm looking for a non-academic job, and uh, I've been reading job postings for about half a year. And often, I find that I would be interested in uh, research work and especially in proposal writing for nonprofits. One of them is uh, Heartland, Heartland Alliance. So my question is. For your interview, for your internships, do you ever consider 
or would you ever call for an interview somebody who does not have a quantitative background? So I think that I would be pretty good in doing qualitative research, but all the job descriptions that I see um, at least have the implication that you have to have a strong quantitative background. Yeah, I think, I think our job application has the wording in there that you have to be able to find the log of things and transform functions or something, which is not actually something that I do on a daily basis. So yeah, maybe that's, that's in there to scare um, some people. But no, I, I, I think that most of the people that work on our staff are pretty qualitative. I'm probably the most quantitative person on, or quantitatively oriented person on our staff. Um, so I, I guess I would encourage you to apply for that kind of position if you're interested in it. Um, and, I, and I think you know, be, being able to write and write well, um, that's extraordinarily important in um, writing grant applications or proposal applications or um, other, other kinds of things like reports, public communications that we do, that's very important. Um, you know, I think it's, it's always great when somebody has a strong quantitative background and I, I think we'd always like to see more of that. The, the thing that I think would be important for you or somebody like you is that you're willing to take on quantitative stuff. You're willing to um, expand and learn in that area if it's, if it's called for. I think you know, having I mean, a specific skill is not so much important with us probably as um, the willingness and the ability and the mindset to take on something new and expand on something. Um, I didn't know any ArcGIS, which is a mapping program, uh, when I came to uh, the Social Impact Research Center, and it's something that we've been using more and more of, so I just kind of took it upon myself to go to a two-day training on ArcGIS and try to get as familiar with it as possible and to use it in some projects. So I think it's that kind of willingness to take on something new and expand that's important. Uh, my question kind of uh, takes off uh, from the earlier question about uh, women's experience interviewing, uh, but kind of moves it maybe in a different direction. I, I recently saw a blog post, there's this blog, something called like, what is it like to be a woman in philosophy? And this uh, lady was writing and saying how a lot of kind of informal interviews are conducted at this big cocktail party at the Philosophy Association uh, conference. And certainly in my discipline, uh, you know, the conference happens, everybody's on the job market and different schools have their receptions, people are drinking wine, people are talking, and that's often a case where you're kind of getting your first impression actually before or outside of an interview situation. You're introducing yourself. And so I was wondering whether you would have any comments or any advice or any thoughts about how that situation, making a first impression at a conference in a more social setting or a more informal setting, cases where it'd be different. Obviously, things like being able to discuss your research concisely or knowing the school, those are going to be the same. But what would be different? Don't drink. Um, <laughs> no, I, I mean, that nothing is actually social. Um, no, no, in any part of a job interview that I've ever been part of, that it, it's all pseudo-social. So things like, uh, um, and that's crucial to, to, to recognize. I think in a cocktail party kind of context, one of the things that's important is, is showing interest in the other person. Uh, it's very, very tiring if you're at one of those cocktail parties and everybody comes up to you and immediately launches into their very concise and good uh, summary of their dissertation and sort of in series uh, and uh, you just get kind of overwhelmed. And so uh, asking some questions, there, it, it, that's a context in which it's really important to, and really appropriate to simply ask, ask for information and then, and then sneak in the information about you as you go along, uh, which is uh, obviously not the case in a formal uh, interview. So, that, so, so reverse the roles, but, do, but also do sneak in the information about yourself, of course, as, as you go would be my strongest. I'd like to build on that a little bit. I think one of the number one things to think about, at least when we have these social events um, in consulting quite often when we're, when we're recruiting, um, and asking the questions, you may have a couple of basic questions that are your go-to questions that you ask everyone, um, but your go-to question is probably everyone else's go-to question. And so when I go to these types of events, everyone asks me, well, why did you make the switch to consulting? And I will give the spiel 80 times. And the people who ask 
really thoughtful questions um, mm -hmm. that are more than sort of the first pass thinking about either our business, either just general consulting or our firm in particular. Those are the people whose names I remember. And so when I go back, I say, Lucy asked a really fantastic question about the growth of the company. She didn't ask me, you know, the top five yeah. questions I hear. And so, you know, it's important to ask questions. I think that's the right approach. Um, but you need to think about yeah, the questions you're going to ask. And if you're going to a specific either university or you're going to a company's reception, you should have done your homework on the institution before you go to that cocktail hour, or you shouldn't, I would encourage you to not go or spend 30 minutes on their website and go late. Yeah, and maybe another thing that happens, so um, the especially in these informal settings, uh, so there, there definitely can be opportunities before you've gone, but often uh, it's also something that's happening, um, let's say after you've already maybe gotten part of the way through, so it's like a second or third round. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's actually a little bit of an opportunity. I mean, all the things that, that were said before definitely apply. But it's also a little bit of an opportunity. Um, a lot of times, by the time you're in an informal setting with people, they've sort of expressed interest in you. And so, in a little bit, they're, they're a little bit on the hook, and they've got a vested interest. And so, it's actually a, uh, it's a good time for you to kind of find out things in a little bit more informal context. So, um, so we just, we took out some, uh, some people, and, and, and it can be, well, I mean, sometimes it, you, you're literally like negotiating uh, things, and, and you're, and, um, but uh, sometimes also um, they're trying to sell you a little bit uh, on, on, so, you know, we just took out some candidates uh, who are interviewing uh, this week, and, uh, and, you know, so, and of course, one thing that always comes up here is, is, uh, is the weather, right, in Chicago, as, as we know today. And, and you know, and so I mean, one thing is, of course, uh, you don't want to say, oh, you know, my if you're interviewing at the University of Chicago, you shouldn't spend the whole dinner talking about surfing or something like that. Uh, you know, you want you want to let them sell you a little bit, probably, uh, and uh, and and you you can, um, and and it's also kind of a, maybe a, a way in which you can find out a little bit more about um, uh, about. Um, some of the details about, uh, you know, about the university, like where you can ask in a little bit more of an informal context. You can kind of, the best thing is if you can kind of get people to sort of talk to each other a little bit uh, sometimes, uh, you know, like at dinner there'll be, for example, three professors and one candidate. And so you can, you can find out a lot about a department or, or a business by seeing how the colleagues interact with themselves. Right. I mean, if they spend the whole dinner complaining about the weather, then you know the weather's a problem. Or if they, uh, or or you know, or, or if they spend the whole dinner complaining about some colleague or, or or lamenting some problem they're having, that that's also a sign. So, I mean, I guess um, you know, you can get a lot uh, for yourself for listening because, of course, you know, when you go to an interview, your objective is always to get the job. But but then afterwards, you you have to decide whether you will actually want the job. And, uh, and I think these informal things are actually, especially because you, you get an opportunity to observe people interacting, is a really good opportunity to, to get that kind of information for later. Thank you. I, yeah, I guess I, I would echo that. I haven't been in too many um, sort of social, social, but really interviewing situations. Um, and the one that I can think of, I didn't negotiate successfully. Um, wow, I'm not telling very good success stories here. Um, it, it, it was another job with another big evaluation company kind of back east, and it would have been in a relatively small and relatively unexciting town in New Jersey. And I had to go out. What's that? What's wrong with New Jersey? D uh, no, not, not just just, this, partic this, this particular town. I'm, I'm from out west, so I don't know, I don't know anything about anything there. Um, but I had to, at the, the very last part of the interview, after talking with all the sort of the senior people, I had to go out to lunch with two people who would have been my peers at this place. Um, and I, I want to know, you know, what, what did they actually think of this, this town? Was it a total downer to live here, or was there enough, enough stuff to do? So it was a good opportunity to find out um, a little bit more, like what life is like at this company and what life is like in the surroundings. Um, and I would imagine in a situation like that, they want to know maybe less about your qualifications because that's all been, you know, you've been put through the ringer by their superiors in the morning. Um, they know all that, but, you know, whether you're somebody that they might just like to work with, whether you're tolerable. I don't know, maybe I was intolerable because I didn't get this job either, um, but something to keep in mind. Hi. Um, so I'm a master's student. I came here right after graduating from undergrad, so I don't have 
really any full-time work experience. So I'm wondering if you have any advice on how to um, translate like volunteer experience, academics into things that would be um, useful for a company to know without making it seem like I'm grasping at straws and just kind of throwing everything at them. I'm happy to take this one. I think if you've truly, so a little bit of background on me. So I went directly to undergrad, so undergrad, I went directly into a PhD program. I didn't do any work per se. And then I went straight to BCG. So I considered myself fully green when I got into the business world. Um, which is like a big gulp moment because you're like, oh gosh, what have I done? Um, but you know, if you're, those activities that you've had, you have to sort of think about what the company, who, whichever company it is that you're gonna work for, what are the attributes of the employees that they're looking for? So if it's initiative and leadership and you've done any sort of leadership, even if it's with a community organization through a volunteer effort, that is something that I would call out and frame as leadership experience. Don't frame it as community service, frame it as leadership. If you've done something where um, you've worked on fundraising or you know, you've volunteered for a political campaign, I mean, you can, you can frame those things as volunteerism or you can frame them as, you know, you've worked, you've been doing work persuading others to believe what you believe. I mean, it's a little bit of, you have to understand what the employer is looking for from a skill set and then adjust your resume in the way that you talk about the work that you've done um, to suit that. And I think there's no way you're going to be able to hide how many years you've <coughs> sort of been in the work market. and if, I don't think it's a detriment, frankly, if you're a young person and you haven't worked, per se, um, for, for a company for a few years and you're applying for a job. What they want to see is someone who takes initiative and is smart and who they see potential in. And I think that is much more exciting than someone who's worked in a lot of places and may or may not be okay. as committed to anything. So if, if, like, if we see a resume and there's people who've done five things for a year and a half to two years each, we wonder if they're actually serious about our business. Um, so I don't know if that helps answer your question or if others have. Also, I don't think it's grasping at straws to frame some of your academic work in non-academic terms, like your thesis as involving extensive project management with the way you had to set up interviews or keep track of information. All right, uh, we can continue the conversation. We have to close out now. Thank you, panelists, for giving your time, for trudging through the snow, <laughs> and for your wisdom. <laughs>